Hey folks, I uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, it's Dr. Gilchrist here, and uh, I am happy to report that I finally was able to find a new microphone, and uh, best of all, I do not have to actually uh, hold one of the microphones with my hands, so you actually get to see all of my hand movements in their full uh, natural glory. Okay. So, um, as the date I'm recording this, it is April 16th, uh, 2020. I have already started to, uh, receive, uh, your zero point method section drafts. Um, I've already given feedback for a few of those. I do plan to get those to you, uh, probably by the time that you get this lecture, uh, and upload it and listen to it, I will have already given you feedback on those drafts. Um, we do have a few homework assignments and a few quizzes coming up very, very soon as well. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about factorial designs. So after our detour in the, into the world of your baby can read and uh, different ways to maintain internal validity, we are now moving on to talking about uh, a factorial experimental design. And to help you better understand what a factorial design involves, we're going to start by giving a brief review of single factor experimental designs. And then we will talk about factorial designs, which are experiments that have at least two independent variables. We'll talk about why they're very useful and why a lot of people tend to prefer them over single factor experiments. We'll talk about the different ways that we design them. And we'll talk about uh, major things that you want to look for when you're doing a factorial design, what is known as a main effect, and what is known as an interaction. And it turns out um, I'm going to teach you a really easy way to determine whether or not there might be a main effect or an interaction in your data without actually doing any statistics yet. That's next semester. You will get all of your fill of statistics uh, next semester. But for right now, we're just going to see if we can find an effect from eyeballing our data. Okay. So let's do a brief review of single factor experimental designs. So for example, uh, your textbook has a really very simple example. So does alcohol actually make one more aggressive? Now, if you've had my bio site clash, you know that the answer is yes. But it's one of those things where um, obviously you want to do some research and make sure that there's actually some evidence that can back that up. So um, this is a pretty straightforward experiment that some researchers did. They had uh, a very basic setup with a placebo group and an alcohol group. So uh, the placebo group, um, I know that last time when we talked about the placebo effect, I talked about the case of a placebo being like a non-alcoholic beer. In this particular study, the placebo that was being used was um, just a very tiny amount of vodka in some orange juice, so basically making a screwdriver. And um, there's so little alcohol that it's certainly not enough to get you uh, to to the legally intoxicated uh, level, but it makes you think it has enough of a change in taste and enough of a change in smell that you think you're drinking alcohol. So that's our placebo group. The alcohol group actually has enough vodka in their orange juice to actually get them to a BAC of 0.1. So um, here's what they ended up doing. So we've got our placebo group and we've got our alcohol group. So this is our independent variable. This is one thing that we've tried to vary. So in this case, uh, the groups were basically told that they were playing a game on a computer with another player that was in a room in a, in a different room. Um, the other player is actually a computer program. And so what's really critical here is that whenever the other player made a mistake, um, the uh, participant would deliver a shock. 
And so uh, the researchers measured the intensity of the shock on a 1 to 10 scale and the duration of that shock. And compared to our placebo group, the alcohol group uh, delivered shocks of higher intensity and shocks for a longer duration, indicating that alcohol, in fact, did make one more aggressive. So in this particular case, um, this is a single factor experiment. We only have one independent variable here, whether or not you got alcohol. And that's it. So with a single factor experiment, we are looking at the effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable. And these, these can be pretty good, but I'm sure many of you might have questions. Um, was gender a factor? Were there other demographic things that uh, played a role? So we didn't vary those. And because of that, we can't really talk about them very much. So you might have questions about future experiments that could be done. But because this is a single factor experiment, that would mean doing more experiments in the future. And that's part of the reason that factorial designs can actually be quite beneficial. And I'll talk about why very soon. So what are factorial designs? A factorial design is basically an experimental study that is basically looking at two or more independent variables. So by and large, um, what we call a two by two design is pretty common. So what this means is that there are two different independent variables and each of those independent variables has two different conditions or two different levels. So this is is a pretty common design, but a factorial design can have more than two independent variables. I've done within subjects factorial designs that have maybe five independent variables. Um, but ideally, what you're doing is you are crossing every level of each independent variable with every level of all other independent variables. So for example, your book uh, talks about a single factor design that looks at driving in a driving simulator when you're on a cell phone, uh, hands-free versus not. And you might be curious as to how this effect might break down by age. Now with a single factor design, you can't really look at that. But if we have a factorial design, we absolutely can. So with a two by two design looking at this, here are our independent variables. We have whether you're on your phone or not, so you either are or you aren't, so this variable has two levels. And then we have another independent variable for age. So we have either younger drivers or we have older drivers. And so when you cross each of these levels, you get four different experimental conditions. Younger drivers on their cell phones, younger drivers not on their cell phones, older drivers on their cell phones, and older drivers not on their cell phones. So this is what will basically happen with the two by two design. If you're crossing all possible conditions, you will wind up with four experimental conditions. So why are factorial designs so useful? Well, let's, let's kind of work with a hypothetical here. So let's say that you are interested in testing what types of methods or interventions are best for developing greater health. You could examine physical activity, do a single factor experiment on that. Uh, you could examine whether a focus on nutrition would help and do a single factor experiment on that. So you could, in essence, do separate single factor experiments for each of these. Um, Diet Coke is not one of those health conditions. I don't know, maybe it should be. <laughs> nah, probably not. So you could do separate studies for each of these, but it's possible that both of these factors interact with each other and with health in interesting ways that they would not do on their own. And interactions in the world are very real and very possible. So think about the effect of alcohol on physiology and biology. That has a particular effect. Think about the effect that uh, an antidepressant like an SSRI like Prozac might have on physiology or biology. So you could look at the separate effects that each of these have on the body, but they also, if we have alcohol and an antidepressant, 
and, and an antidepressant, they're going to interact with each other as well. And we would be wise to consider what happens when these different variables interact with each other in the world, because they do. So this is why we do factorial designs. Items and variables and factors out in the world interact with each other. And it's important to consider how these things interact with each other. So here's kind of another example that comes from a study that was mentioned in your book. Factorial designs uh, can also help us test theories related to alcohol cues. So we've already seen from that single factor design that I mentioned at the very beginning that alcohol may potentially make one more aggressive. But you might be curious as to how it might make people more aggressive. So this was a research study that was uh, done by uh, Bruce Bartholo and uh, Heinz. Uh, Bruce Bartholo, by the way, is uh, a researcher over at the University of Missouri. Um, when I mentioned alcohol lab studies, he is definitely one of those labs that I mentioned. He also does a lot of really cool work on violence in video games. Um, but in this particular study, they were kind of curious as to whether alcohol or even so much as seeing alcohol would prime aggressive tendencies. And so uh, what they did in their very basic study is they gave people a lexical decision task. Now, for those of you that haven't had my cognitive psychology course, a lexical decision task is when I basically give you a string of letters and you very basically have to say whether it forms a word or not. So if it's not a word, it'll usually be something that's scrambled or gibberish. And if it is a word, well, it's going to look like a word. Now, depending on the condition in this lexical decision task, the words were either related to aggressive things like the word invade, and the other words were neutral, like purse. There's no aggressive connotation there. Additionally, so in addition to the words either being related to aggressive things or having a neutral component, um, it Participants were also kind of briefly shown a photo related to alcohol paraphernalia, like a beer bottle or a Pilsner glass or something like that, versus a photo of a plant. So these are two different independent variables. They each have two levels. And so when we cross them, we get four very different conditions. Of particular interest for us is going to be aggressive words primed with an alcohol photo, and then we we want to kind of see what will happen with neutral words to a lesser extent, and then plant plants being paired with a neutral word will kind of function as a baseline. So what did Bartholo and Heinz actually find? So what you're looking at here is reaction time data. So how long it took people to identify um, whether or not the string of letters actually formed a word. Um, and in the case of people that were primed uh, with an alcohol photo, they were more likely to um, basically identify an aggressive word compared to a neutral word. So here's the thing. I realize that this is a difference of about maybe 10 seconds or 10 milliseconds or so, and that doesn't really seem like very much, but as I've kind of learned, especially when you're dealing with things like reaction time, 10 milliseconds can make a huge difference. To kind of put that into perspective, um, 10 milliseconds is about five action potentials. Um, now, on the other hand, if we look at our plant group, um, they actually show the reverse effect. People that are shown photos of a plant actually uh, have a faster time identifying neutral words compared to aggressive words. Now, the difference definitely isn't as large in terms of magnitude. Um, but another way that we can kind of look at this is we can graph our data. And so what you can actually see here is you can see that difference kind of spelled out for you with the graph. So with an alcohol photo, you can see that there's a huge difference between uh, identifying aggressive words versus neutral words. You can see that that effect crosses over once that switches to a plant. So they're actually faster for neutral words than they are for aggression words. And I know that you won't understand this now, but notice how we've got this flip. 
Here, they identify aggression faster. Here, they identify neutral faster. What you are looking at here is what is called a crossover interaction. So um, the identification of aggressive versus neutral words changes depending on the photo type you get. So this is what we call an interaction. And here's a quick hint, and we'll talk about this more um, when we talk about identifying from our data. If these two lines are not in parallel, there's definitely an interaction here. You can very, very clearly see that because the lines do actually cross over. So we call this uh, a crossover interaction because of that. Now, another example of this actually comes from work by um, looking at interaction to test a theory of memory comes from a 1978 study by Mickey Chi and colleagues. Um, and so one of the things that um, I've been interested in partially because um, I do occasionally do work with children, and I did when I was in graduate school. We know, and it's pretty well documented, that in terms of memory abilities, children tend to remember fewer things than adults do. And it's not entirely clear why. Well, in 1978, uh, Mickey Chi uh, actually developed a theory that part of the reason that kids, um, young children, uh, have a smaller memory capacity compared to adults is because of domain-specific knowledge. So they actually had um, children who were chess experts. So children who were experts in chess compared to adults that were novices in chess remember lists of digits and then also try to remember positions of chess pieces. So in this case, the child chess experts have more knowledge in chess than the novices do. And um, so what we actually find, here are the number of items we're called. And again, in this instance, we have a crossover interaction. Um, so here, our child chess experts, they have a much better memory for chess pieces than adults do. However, in terms of a digit span task, adults do better than children. So what this kind of tells us is that the development of memory span that we see with age, that memory abilities, are also based on domain-specific knowledge. It doesn't matter if you're an adult, if you have no working knowledge of chess and you don't know what to make of different chess positions on the board, you're not going to remember as many chess pieces as a child that has more knowledge and more exposure to chess does. So just something to think about. Now, I'm going to show you another example. This one's kind of goofy, but I think it'll kind of get the message across about, um, about uh, factorial designs. So it's very, very common to talk about the effect that heat and humidity have upon each other. Um, I actually really love summers here in Missouri. I know a lot of people complain about the humidity, but I'm from Florida. Sorry, I, I have to say it. I'm from Florida. And the humidity down in Florida is always way, way worse. And so we know that humidity interacts with heat to change how it feels to us. So let's say we decided to do a goofy study that basically looks at how hot weather has an effect on performance. Now, because temperature and humidity do interact with each other, we don't necessarily want to do two single factor experiments, one that looks at temperature and one that looks at humidity. That's costly. That's two studies I have to run instead of one. And Temperature and humidity absolutely interact with each other. And because we know that they can interact with each other, we should be doing a factorial design. So what I decide to do, let's say I make this mock experiment. We're going to look at the effects of temperature and humidity together. So we're going to create two different levels of temperature. We're either going to have 68 degrees Fahrenheit, basically room temperature, a little cold for me, frankly, uh, and 95 degrees basically Florida. And then we're going to have two levels of humidity. So we're going to cross humidity with temperature. So we're going to have either low temp, room temp, or high temp, low humidity, 20%, and high humidity, 70%. And yes, we do want to do a factorial design because humidity always makes heat feel worse. 
So we have these two different independent variables, each with two levels. And because of that, when we cross all levels of our independent variable, we get four different conditions. So we have room temperature, and that can either be presented with low humidity, condition number one, or high humidity, condition number three. We can have 95 degrees high temperature with low humidity, condition number two, and high humidity, condition number four. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. Next time we will talk about different types of factorial designs.